Hi there, everybody. My name is Adeo Ressi. I'm CEO of the Founder Institute. I'm really excited to host this webinar today, uh, talking with a very good friend of mine about starting businesses that matter. Now, um, I've been an entrepreneur for about 25 years, and, and I've started over nine different companies, and I can tell you that it's a tough journey, but if you're going to go on a journey that's tough, you might as well work on something important. So if you're thinking to start a company now, the Founder Institute is there to help you. Uh, we have chapters in uh, over 40 cities that are enrolling right this moment. You can learn more about joining one of our programs to launch your business by going to fi.co slash join. And if you're interested in building something that matters in the world, something that's going to make the world better, you can learn more about our views on that by going to fi.co slash good. And in 2018, we've moved the entire company away from just starting any kind of business to starting businesses that matter, which really uh, is the, the goal of our uh, topic today. And we, we, can't, we don't have anyone better to talk about it than my good friend, Mark. So a lot of startups being created today are trying to take a nickel and turn it into a dime. They're doing what I call revenue arbitrage. So they're taking um, some sort of unit economic measurement, you know, a cost of customer acquisition and a lifetime value equation and squeezing money in the middle. You have people who are taxing the Internet like Google and Facebook, uh, uh, taking money out of that equation. And the reality is many of these companies are making small incremental improvements on how we live, but they're not really advancing the state of humanity. So how do you start uh, a company that's going to change the world and make the world a better place? How are you going to uh, work on problems that really matter We make things that, that make the world better? And, and, you know, there's no better time to do that than right now. We have political problems, environmental problems, uh, health problems, food problems, transportation problems. Uh, and, and every other kind of problem. And one of my favorite um, entrepreneurs in the world uh, is, is going to come on and talk about one of those problems today, uh, as well as some others that he sees in the world. But Mark, I've known for probably close to, to, to 20 years, more like 18 years. And he, we met in the gaming world. And he came out of the gaming world and said, after he sold his company and started something in transportation that's exceptional, rather than stealing the thunder and telling too much about it, I've watched you on this journey, Mark, and you are really one of the my favorite human beings. So why don't you oh, tell you. about your background to everyone who's joining yeah, us? Sure. So, yeah, and, and hey, real real pleasure to spend the afternoon chatting with you about this. Um, as you know, this has been uh, has been quite a journey. I've been working on Arkimoto now for almost 11 years. Uh, and in a, in a second, Jonathan is going to stream uh, a, a quick video that shows you sort of where we are today. Um, but, you know, you were there to drive our very first prototype and, and sort of to, to imagine that uh, that we that we'd actually get to where we are right now uh, from there I think was a stretch and of course uh, the road ahead is is uh, is is a long and perilous one as well so um, but you know to, to the basic to the basic point um, I was uh, I, I've been a video game developer almost my whole life so I think I started programming when I was about seven on the Apple II uh, became a commercial game developer uh, right after college and then started a company. Um, and my, my thought was I would, I would just sort of make games until I figured out what I really wanted to do with my life. And when we sold garage games in 2007, um, I realized it was, it was, you know, sort of time to put the, put the money where the mouth had been, uh, talking, you know, the world, the world's got, uh, problems that are very present. Um, and, you know, to me, the, the one of climate change is one that's, that is, it's right in front, in front of us, uh, uh, up here in, in Eugene, Oregon, which is where we're headquartered. Uh, we're seeing yet another, you know, sort of uh, uh, out, outside of the norm fire season. Uh, I know that Northern California has had that. There, there are weather events going on all over the planet. Um, and so that was, that was a problem that, that I felt like was, was really worth spending time tackling. 
You know, if you think of the, the I think the old mantra used to be, I, I work to live. But the reality is now, I mean, if you're going to spend 10 hours of every day doing something, uh, 12 hours a day doing doing something, especially if you're going to start a company uh, and, and put years of your life into something, um, why not make that something that, that you find to be truly meaningful? And I think that that's, that's really important for entrepreneurs for a few reasons, um, not the least of which is that that. Companies are hard. I mean, they, they almost every successful entrepreneur I've ever talked to has, uh, has gone through one or more likely many uh, very difficult spots in the building of an enterprise. And one of the things that gets you through those difficult spots is working on something that you are truly passionate about, something you truly believe in. So if you guys want to catch the catch the quick update. Uh, uh, Good afternoon. Welcome to Arkimoto's 2018 Q2 earnings update video. We do one of these each quarter to give our stakeholders deeper insight into where we are as a company. Let's go to our first plan rental location. Arkimoto's mission is to help catalyze the shift to a sustainable transportation system. And we believe there are three key requirements to the product that makes that shift possible. It's gotta be useful for the wide range of everyday driving trips, it's got to be an order of magnitude more efficient than cars on the road today, and it's got to be affordable by the mass market. We believe we are well on our way to delivering on that product vision. Our two overarching goals for the year are to get into retail series production and to flesh out the end-to-end -end customer experience. And our rental experience centers are all about that latter goal. And here we are. We believe the rental experience model has several distinct advantages. A more capital efficient pathway for broad market awareness, maximum revenue generation from our early vehicles on the road, and the ability for our customers to experience the Arkimoto as if it were their own in beautiful destination marketplaces. We anticipate that our first two rental locations, one here in Eugene, one in Southern California, will be open in the next couple of months. And now back to the factory. In Q1, we mapped out four discrete production series for the year. First, the signatures, which we completed in June. The signature series customers are longtime Arkimoto supporters who are even now giving us the benefit of word of mouth in market. We expect that will only increase as more fun utility vehicles hit the road. We're now onto the beta. Just last week, beta units rolled off the line under their own power for the first time. The beta includes both significant improvements and a reduced build time versus the early signature vehicles. We continue to make subtle refinements to the product improved steering, improved ergonomics, improved quality, as we move through the rest of the betas and onto pilot. Our first physically destructive tests correlated well with our simulation models, which means that we will be able to optimize the pilot design with added confidence. All the essential fabrication hardware is now here, and we're beginning to fabricate end-to-end -end parts for the Arkimoto vehicle, as well as the tooling necessary for manufacturing and assembly processes. We're now able to go from raw material through part cutting, forming, welding, and final machining in-house. We have made significant progress on preparing for the full pilot build, where we will manufacture all of the custom parts for the frame and chassis internally. We now have the very first pilot chassis built on the floor. By the end of this summer, we plan to have every component of this parts manufacturing puzzle fully up and running in preparation for pilot build in the fourth quarter. In spite of the fact that we're holding off on significant marketing efforts until we have pilot vehicles on the road, our pre-order list continues to grow. We started Q2 by ringing the closing bell, and we're coming up on our one-year anniversary as a public company. We're now looking ahead to scale production in 2019, 2020, and beyond. We submitted our first draft of Arkimoto's $100 million Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Federal Government Loan application to dramatically expand production on the West Coast, as well as build an East Coast manufacturing facility. This is a truly exciting time. We're bringing our retail go-to-market strategy into crisp focus. Our initial series of limited production run vehicles are on the road. Our first beta units are on the road. And we're looking forward to ever increasing volumes of successively more refined FUVs as we push to retail series production by the end of this year. We thank you for your continued support and look forward to seeing you on the road. So, yeah, 
I don't know if that's uh, if the audio came through there for for everybody, but uh, I can hear it. Oh, good. Oh, good. Well, you know, one, and one of the things that we've, uh, you know, you talk about the, you talked a little bit about sort of the, the, the approaches that a lot of startups take in terms of, um, you know, improving, I think, uh, improving efficiency of transactions or, uh, or, or disintermediating layers and things like that. I mean, that's, that, that, that is not itself an unworthy goal. And I think that that's those, a lot of those advances are things that, that you can take advantage of. Uh, in, in the pursuit of, of, of sort of world changing ideas and world changing missions as well. Um, one of the, you know, one of the things we decided to do when we went public, uh, is that we weren't just going to do a, you know, kind of the standard quarterly, quarterly report, you know, here, here, uh, uh, here's, here's a 20 page long, uh, densely worded paper, but that actually every quarter we're going to include, uh, a video component that just gives people a, a, a a very uh, visual, obviously, and an engaging update on where we are as a company, um, and that that's proven to be a really effective way of kind of communicating our progress uh, through the process. Well, it was great to see the the hardware uh, moving into the factory. I mean, that 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 shows progress more than anything else. You've got robots and lasers. You know, that's <laughs> those are always those are always wins with the uh, with the with the viewing public. Sharks and lasers. Okay, so we have a series of questions, and what I'd like to do, though, is for anyone in the audience, and we have a great, you know, over 400 people watching concurrently right now, if you have a question, pop it in the chat. My team will filter them through, and we'll try and get them on screen for you. But, you know, I want to ask, you cover a lot of stuff in the intro about your background and, and you know, uh, different things, but I want to just talk about Eugene for one second, because... You know, a lot of people are like, do I need to be in Silicon Valley to start a great company? And, you know, Eugene is about as far from Silicon Valley as you can. We call it the, it's the Silicon Shire. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like people here are generally, you know, they're, they're pretty chill. They smoke their pipe weed. But if it, if it's necessary to go, go save, uh, save the planet, they, they, they step up. Right. So, so the, the, the good thing about Eugene is it's historically known for people that take a big belief in saving the planet. I mean, a lot of like Earth First, a lot of movements have sprung out of there. Uh, some good, some bad, but, but environmentally it's a leader, but it's not known for technology per se, right? I mean, it has a good right. university. Although you know, I would say that, like like I think many areas around the country, the the Eugene is experiencing a tech renaissance, and so we're the, both because of, of kind of some real efforts of the of the Technology Association of Oregon, uh, and uh, a lot of homegrown uh, startups are now springing up and um, starting to collaborate together and starting to to meet together and share stories and share share uh, tips and tricks and so on. Uh, and that's really building a, a, a really nice tech scene uh, here in Eugene, which is cool to see. But I think to your point, you know, and, and I grew up in Eugene, which is why I, I moved back here after college. Um, and it was it's a place where you can drink the water. It's a place where, you know, people have been recycling since the, you know, their, that concept became popular at all. Um, a, a, a ton of awareness of, of, of that kind of think think globally, act locally uh, mentality, um, whether it's bicycle commuting or, um, or, or just, you know, just working to uh, relocalize food production, eat organic food, eat healthy, be healthy. Um, and I think that that, that sort of ethos is, was, was very uh, fundamental in forming Arkimoto for sure. Um, so basically, yeah. I mean, but great companies can get started anywhere. And so there was this, yeah. this, this environmental movement and environmental consciousness, and you, your company just happened to play on that. It, so there, every city and town has a certain character, whether it be you know wine country in Napa or you know factory work in Detroit that you can leverage for whatever business you're looking to create. Right. Yeah. You know, definitely start where you are is, is a is a good uh, is a good ethos to start with, right? Um, I think that the notion that you've got to, uh, you know, from from maybe 20 years ago, where you've got to move to the valley in order to to start anything of significance, um, uh, 
I, I would see that 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 notion is is fading somewhat. And I think, and I, I would attribute a lot of that to uh, you know organizations like the Founder Institute that are uh, going out. You know, you've got chapters. You said you had forty three. Uh, programs starting this next semester around the world? Yeah, they're they're recruiting right now. We're actually operating in in, in excess of a hundred at the moment. Yeah, I wanted to say right. you were you had more than a hundred cities on the planet. 200. So so and that's two hundred. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so you're taking you're basically you have a global network now that is sharing information, learning from each other, um, and and you know getting kind of moving really globalizing that that startup uh, that that whole startup. Um, culture. Well, we're getting some good questions in, so I want to, uh, we're organizing them, so if we don't, add, even though yours may have come in first, we're going to try and keep it in the topic uh, flow. So one question is, you didn't have a background in the in this field. How, how did you move over? How did you no, I, in um, fact, I was like, I was, I was like, why would I take more electrical engineering classes? I'm never going to do a hardware project. I'm a, I'm a software guy. Um, and, and I think that was that was definitely a, a transition. I think when I when I started Arkimoto, my my greatest qualification for doing a vehicle company was I played with Legos as a child. Um, but you know, you you can it turns out you can learn stuff right as as you go. Um, and and in this case, I had a I had a you know one I I have always had the good fortune to work with very talented people uh, aqua, across a range of skills necessary to do a project like this. So. I am not the the mechanical engineer, but we've got some amazing mechanical engineers on our team. Uh, I haven't built a factory, but we've got guys on the factory and production team who've been doing that their entire careers. Um, and so I think it, you know, in in any uh, in any new endeavor, you got to make sure that you have the right people uh, on the field playing the, all the positions. The the one the the one thing I think I would add, it, it, particularly in terms of sort of new vehicle companies is that the, the ones that have, have sort of made the most yardage uh, don't appear to be the ones that were started from uh, from within the auto industry, for example, right? It, it, well, Fisker started within the auto industry, dead. Right, but, it, but that, <laughs> not just Fisker. I mean, it's a whole slew of them that, that kind of started with that the traditional automotive mindset uh, didn't make it, but the ones that, have, that came out of more of a technology look at the world, more of a software look at the world, uh, are still chugging along, um, and, I, and I and and part of that comes down to being willing to to rethink things like the distribution model or the service model or uh, how your how your vehicle actually interacts and lives within your digital lifestyle, to use a totally lame term, um, you know. But but it's like you, you the the I, I would say you know one it has definitely been on the hardware side it's been a huge learning curve. So how do you actually Build something. How do you manufacture something? How do you how do you deal with quality? How do you deal with uh, vendors and supply chain? And how do you think about problems through that lens? Um, that was that was definitely uh, a, a whole new set of skills to bring on. Um, but there were definitely skills that translated, and I think gave us an edge. You know, one is just even just thinking about the vehicle itself. Um, we are really trying to crack code of what's what really splits the gap between the motorcycle and the car, uh, and and yet if you, if you even if you just look at the three wheel vehicle space, the 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 teams that have gone after the three wheel problem either from the motorcycle perspective or, or from the car perspective have come out with products that generally aren't as good as either of those two categories. Uh, whereas we were going after something, you know, I came at it from the video game perspective, which is like, hey, we can make whatever the heck we want as long as it actually solves the problem that we're trying to solve. Mark, I want to tell for everyone in the uh, audience here, it, th- this is not an ordinary vehicle. This is like driving heaven. Uh, you have the stability of a car with the fun and excitement of a motorcycle. And as Mark said, I've driven every one uh, and they've just gotten better and better, faster, more stable, uh, easier to drive. And, and the latest iteration is just wick, wick. I mean, I have never experienced anything like it. So, uh, you know, before I learned, the, term, I learned a new term when I was uh, on the U of O campus, this guy rode by on, a, on his bike and he's like, sick wit. Like, <laughs> I think that, I think that was good. I think it's good. You know, I don't, I don't know exactly well, what it means, but it's, it's a new thing. I, 
I've been waiting to make a, a deposit on one. Uh, and uh, I think so. I, I'm going to pledge right now that the minute this is over and you keep an eye out for it, you're going to get a deposit nice. on your, your site for me. Uh, and because I love, I love them. So it's, it's like a, it's like a hundred dollars, right? Or saying how much is it? That yeah, even the, if it were more. It's a hundred bucks fully refundable at any time for any reason. Of course, once we're actually ready to produce yours, we're going to require a, a larger non-refundable deposit. Yeah, but they're um, under so, fifteen thousand yeah, dollars, right? We're, we're, well, and, and that's so. So again, you know, we we the the purpose of the company was to build something that one is an order of magnitude more efficient than cars. Like about it's about ten times as efficient as kind of the average car on the road today per unit uh, of power for transportation. Is that the measurement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, miles per gallon equivalent is about yeah, ten yeah. times the MPG of of your average car of, of today. Um, and, and you like to say, because th this goes back to your big world changing problem statement, I don't mean to interrupt, but you like to, to say, and I've heard you said this a thousand times, that you don't need a, thousands of pounds of metal to communicate, to, to transport an 80 pound person for, or a 150 right. pound person. Yeah, from if, I, if I'm going for a cup of coffee by myself and I'm jumping in a 4,000 pound steel construct, I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's insane. What we, the way that we transport ourselves it's insane. It, it makes our cities suck, and it is absolutely killing the planet. But we keep doing it because there's really not a, a, a our, our cities are now built around that mode, and there's not really a good viable alternative to it uh, in the marketplace. And that was really our well, goal. And we've overcrowded the road with these, these big vehicles that that take up so much space. So if you have a smaller, lighter weight vehicle, you solve other problems as well. Yeah, I mean, it lets it lets it lets communities should let communities relocalize. Uh, you know, we we use about forty percent of our urban landscape is covered with asphalt to move and park cars. I mean, this, think about that for just a second. Like almost half, almost half of the geography is is paved over more dead than the deadest desert, just so that we can go from point A to point B. Um, and and I think when you when you I mean, yeah, the kind of one size fits all vehicle made sense in uh, 1908 when there weren't any. Um, and you, it, all you would ever get was one vehicle and you pretty much had to do everything. In today's world, you've got vehicle sharing services. You can rent vehicles by the ride, by the hour, by the day. So if you need a, a more, uh, a, a larger vehicle to solve a particular problem, they're available. Um, but but what the problem is that we use those larger vehicles to solve a problem that is that is much simpler than the than the solution we're using. Right. So I'll tell you why I want to get an Arcimoto because my commute m most of my days are spent in Palo Alto, which is maybe ten miles edge to edge uh, yeah. when you include Mountain View and a little bit of the surrounding towns that I go to. And to your point, to drive a Five ten thousand pound vehicle in that in a ten mile radius to get a cup of coffee, lunch, or whatever is 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 literally stupid. Yeah. Um, there are questions coming in, so I don't want to uh, let them. I want to get to some of these questions. So so, but before I do one one last thing, you were talking about working in or on the business. So, and and there's a question from Phil relating to this. How do you get these technical people to help you when you don't have technical knowledge? And it, it's because you were working on the business, right, in this macro view versus working in the business as a day-to-day -day person. And maybe you can... Yeah, well, and I think that. early on, it was actually, the, the hard part was not knowing what skill sets I actually needed to include in the team, right? And so, so it was, what are the particular, what are the even the job titles that this organization should have to, to do the development portion, let alone the actual go-to-production step? Um, and, you know, honestly, I, I wish I could claim that I'm, I'm like, you know, super good at hiring people and uh, knew exactly how to figure it out. But the honest truth is that the Arcimoto team largely assembled itself. That is that we, you know, I, we, we definitely said, here's what we're doing. We're going to here's here's the problem we're going to go after. And people would come to us and they would say, I'm in. Here's what I know how to do. I want to make this a part of my life story. Uh, and that, I think, is really part of the power of uh, having a having a purpose as an organization that is is beyond just, hey, we're going to, you know, make the next, um, you know, Internet advertising platform. But you you will find that there are a lot of folks out there who actually 
one, are very good at a wide variety of things, and two, want to work on something with purpose. And so that's been, uh, I mean, I think if, if anything, the major skill that I've developed over the 11 years of the company is actually just learning how to tell the story and learning how to tell it to the right people and in the right venues in order to really, in order to attract the people who will make that vision real. That is now, you answered like six questions that are coming in the chat with that oh. statement. Which, uh, yeah, so I just, so really, let, let me just paraphrase that so that because it, there's questions like, how do you become a good persuader, or convince me? So basically, like, communicating your vision essentially led to the right set of circumstances come together, the right people, the right investors, et cetera, and right. eventually led to your success. Well, and I think, you know, I, I, when, when, when you and I first met, I was a really introverted guy. Um, and I was, when I was at Garage Games, you know, I was the, I was the technical president, right? I was, I was like, okay, um, if, if nobody else can figure out how to solve this net code problem, I'm going to jump in the code and solve that particular problem. So whatever, whatever sort of tech problem we had at the company, um, I was able to jump in and, and be the guy that really helped solve the problem. Uh, when I started Arkimoto, I was like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not that guy anymore. I, I, I can't be that for this team. Um, and what I really wanted to do was just kind of more be the uh, the kind of the coach from the sidelines or the help, you know, help assemble things, but not really get out in front of it. And I realized a couple of years in that if I didn't actually jump in, if I didn't get in front of this idea that I was talking about, if I didn't actually learn how to tell the story, that it was going to fail for sure. Uh, and that's when I that's when I realized I kind of had the choice of am I going to change my personality or am I going to see this thing that I really care about die? Uh, and, and, and it, it, it was, it, it wasn't easy, um, because I hated speaking publicly in front of people. I hated having my name in print. Uh, I thought I sounded dumb on a microphone, all the, all the same kind of fears that everybody who's kind of just getting into speaking in publicly feels right. They you sound I, great. I right. No, but, but again, like you just, it's just, I would say the one, the, 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 the well, the two things got me through one was just practice. I sucked. For years, right? I, my, you go back to the the first pitch deck I, I I brought down to Sand Hill Road, and I was staying at your house in 2009. By the way, horrible year to fundraise, no matter what you were fundraising for. Um, but but it's just you again. You just say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep doing it. I'm gonna listen to feedback. I'm gonna I'm gonna get better at it. And you, a lot of it is just getting better at it by doing it. And then the second thing is having that again. I I keep coming back to it, but it's that having a purpose that you're actually fighting for something that you really care about will give you the inspiration and, and the motivation to move past your own internal roadblocks. And if you don't, if you don't have that component, then it's, it's, I think it's a lot easier to quit. There's so many questions coming in about, you know, how did you find these people? Where did you spread the message? Um, Mary asked, uh, this, uh, uh, Shai asked it. Uh, uh, Lisa's asking about it. Um, you well, know, well, so, for, yeah. And part of that is is actually geographical. So you know, Eugene is it, it, it's not it was not sort of traditionally a tech hub, but it's very much like for for a city its size has a ton of manufacturing um, of, of like a kind of small scale lean manufacture operations. Uh, it was one of the hubs of motor coach manufacture. You know, the big RVs, uh, Country Coach, Marathon, uh, Monaco were all about five miles away from where we were headquartered. And one of the factors that was just uh, sort of timing was that though that industry collapsed in the financial crisis. And so there was the a motor ton home, of, The motor yeah. home industry. People don't know. We have people from all around the world here. Ah, just yeah, so yeah. you know. Big buses with, that yeah. rich people buy to go to Burning Man. Um, well, and, 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 and tour in yes. America, you have lots of roadways and parks. So people buy houses on wheels and that market collapsed in the financial crisis. Yes. And it was, so yeah. there were a ton of really talented vehicle engineers, uh, production guys, uh, all the rest who were looking for something to do right around that time. Um, and a number of them jumped on board, you know, very early on. And so that, that was, that kind of provided the nucleus of the team um, that, that was doing the, the actual uh, engineering and, and building of the vehicles. 
But I mean, there, so Mary also brought up, but there are a lot of good causes out there. Do you have any sense of why they cared, found, and cared about you versus the fifty other causes? Well, I, I, you know, some of the some of the guys were like, "This is this is like my atonement, right?" They'd been building these giant rigs for for people to you know drive around the country and and burn uh, you know horrendously inefficient houses on wheels. And so the, I think that this particular project was very attractive to those folks. One, because it was still a vehicle, and two, because it was sort of, uh, you know, it was it was an antithesis of, of 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 the excess mentality that had been going on in the early 2000s. So they um, knew that those those other forms of transportation, which they themselves were working on, was stupid. I presume, right? They they yeah. Well, you know, and and it's for a lot of people, it's like you know, everybody's got to eat. You got to put food on the table for the family. If you're an engineer, and the engineering options are I'm going to go work on, you know, giant earth destroying machines. It's like, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a paycheck. Um, and, and, uh, or, and, or just not even a lot of thought about it. I mean, I think we're, that, that, that the, that the problem that we saw that, that, you know, in the early 2000s and in the late 90s, you know, just sort of that, those early warnings about global warming and about climate change, um, and certainly the awareness of environmental destruction. Uh, that 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 didn't really seep out into kind of mass consciousness until much more recently. Well, and uh, you, we got some interesting questions here. I want to get to um, because I, I know part of the answers, and I think they're going to amaze people. I mean, so Gregory was asking about how many people made the first prototype. Let me finish the questions. Uh, Lewis is like, what roles did you have? What what people? And then you know, what was the first step? What Lisa was talking about. What I don't think people realize is you kind of bootstrapped this and built a ton of different prototypes for almost no money. And a lot of people are like, oh, a vehicle company takes hundreds of millions of dollars. And it may eventually take that much. But you made, I mean, you talk about some of the things you did early on because it's phenomenal. And it's an inspiration because a lot of times you may be sitting there, I can't do it, it's too complicated. And then when you hear what he did, you, you, well, and, 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 and so, so to be clear, I did not, I did not set out right after Garage Games to start Arkimoto. I approached this marketplace as a consumer. I was like, okay, I got cash in the pocket. I want to buy a vehicle that is going to solve my daily transportation problems. So I just started searching. I started I, for months. I was searching for. I didn't want a full size car because, again, you don't need four thousand pounds of steel to go get coffee. Um, and I knew it needed to be electric. And I wanted something that was cool and high quality, and but but overall, I wanted something affordable so that if I got something and drove it around and it was cool, then other people would be like, "Oh, I should get one of those things too." Um, but what what finally did it for me is like after not finding what I was looking for for months and months and months, I saw a kit vehicle in the Eugene Celebration Parade called the Buggy, e, and it was this three wheeler little kind of like bicycle meets motorcycle meets you know get around thing. And it was just, it, all of a sudden, that, that was the light bulb moment was seeing this thing. And that light bulb really illuminated the gap between the motorcycle and the car. And because the guy who, who designed that sold it as a kit, we were able to you know, buy the kit, here are all the pieces, let's put it all together. And it wasn't a big jump from that point to go, oh, well, like a Lego set, if, if, there, if the pieces were slightly different and we put them together in a slightly different way, we might actually really be able to build a mass market product uh, in this category. And I, you know, I figured, you know, it'd probably take six months, probably six months till we had a market ready product. <laughs> eight years, eight years later, you know, finally, finally, eight, eight generations, eight iterations. So what we did though, is we, we did take a very kind of bare bones, iterative approach. We always, you know, the team has always had um, builders as well as designers. So it was because we were starting with a kit, it was all about putting it together and how do we put it together well and what's, you know, what can break and what can't. And so um, it was, it was that having that starting point was really helpful uh, for that iteration process. And also it was a reminder that the solution could be very simple, right? It didn't have to, if we knew that if we ended up in, in car land that we were screwed because, you know, nobody was going to, was going to go and fund us to go make a car. A car is a, multi hundred million dollar at least exercise if not billion to, to put a new automotive program together um so we knew we had to do and, something and, 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 simpler. 
Just to explain why, for not to interrupt, why because I think that's again we people don't know uh, the car regulations in America are nuts. They are, you know, the CEO goes to jail if they have knowing issues in in the vehicle. Whereas the the motorcycle and and conversely the which includes the three wheel category is is really much less regulated and and therefore much more open to innovation it, it is a bit more of, of of sort of that that uh i think i think that does afford more um sort of creativity in terms of options and so on but i mean i think the real factor is just that the expectation of what a car is 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 so set in people's mm -hmm. minds and you have uh you have a, a hundred years of, of of companies just getting better and better and better at making all the little you know gaps go away and the fit, the sound of the door when it's closing and the power windows and the, and so and every single one of those parts is its own supply chain it's, a, it's 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 its own relationship with some major manufacturer that if you don't get that you know if they don't look at you and go hey i mean even you know tesla had this problem for years where where you know uh the the, the sort of tier one suppliers would just be like whatever, you know, you're some California car company. Um, and it wasn't until they obviously hit it out of the park repeatedly that then, you know, kind of the major suppliers wanted to wanted to really do business, as far as I understand. Um, yeah, no one, well, the volume, right? It's a volume issue. Yeah, it's it was, volume. And, and, it's, and again, and, and to your point of like uh, executive liability, I mean, if you, if you are a seatbelt manufacturer and some startup comes to you and says, hey, you know, I want to put that in my vehicle, then you know that you're the one who's who's going to be carrying the water down the road um, if, if they get knocked out or whatever. So so that's I, I mean, I think that's why it's it, transportation in particular is very stacked against new entrants um, and why we've had to had to had to sort of carve a very different path. But but to me, the, that pathway always went through the question what is the simplest thing that solves this problem well? Because the simpler we make it, um, the the more competitive we can be. The lower the lower the cost can be. The the uh, less complicated the manufacturing processes can be. The, I want to I want to go with that for a second because that's also a super important point for everyone on the call. I, I've known you before, obviously, but since day one of the company, I don't think your vision's changed at all. Am, am, am I? No. You, you, go back, I mean, you can go back and look at stuff we were saying in 2007. The products changed a lot, well, of course. Yeah. But, but the, the, the intent, what we've been shooting for, you know, it was, I, I think what, what really it was when I was in that parade, you know, when I was on the sidelines of that parade and I saw that thing, it was like, there, you know, sort of like there's gold in those hills. I don't know where it is exactly, but in the in that direction, um, there's an answer. And I think that was maybe that that's the sort of the takeaway there is that when you get that inspiration moment, um, it's not to be so fixated on necessarily having the answer, but understanding that you're you're really moving in a direction. And that's what well, that iterative have, process is all about. Right, and you haven't changed in in that that direction at least, and the product, as you mentioned, changed a lot. And I think that's one of the. I mean, you must. Uh, I'm okay, but let's just take a tangent on that for a sec. I know it's been a struggle for you, Mark. Like I know, right? Yeah. And and now yeah. you're seeing some success, and I'm sure there's a lot of struggle in the success moment. Um, you know. I, 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 first of all, you know, if you don't want to talk about the struggle, but I mean, because it's, it's, you're in a well, relatively good point, but you persevere, right? Yeah, and I know. Maybe you could talk about, was it the vision and purpose that helped you persevere? But because you were really in tough spots at times. Yeah, multiple times. You know, we, we, uh, I, I could go down the list. We, you know, we, in, uh, we put the generation five prototype on the road to, uh, to fundraise. To, for the next stage of the company, uh, it crashed on its maiden voyage, you know, day 20 of the California tour. Um, that was the first time we really did kind of a, a shutdown of the organization. And, you know, but, but each time, and then, and then generation, you know, after seven years, we got generation seven on the road after two and a half years of working on that one vehicle and then looking at it and going, trying, trying with a very honest eye to realize that this thing did not solve the problem we were trying to solve. And it was 
probably destined for failure in the marketplace, which was probably why nobody was fighting on the investment opportunity at that point either. Um, well, and, and that led to your biggest innovation. Which, was that when you came up with it? And then, you know, a, an immediate reboot of the company in the spring of 2015. Uh, but I think, I think to your, to your point, what, I, what, what I had to keep asking myself at each failure, because it was seven years of a set, I mean, a lot of great forward progress, right? Like we, we created new systems. We, we refined, to your point, we refined the suspension. We refined the steering. We refined the, the feel. All of those things kept getting better, but we kept not getting to the answer. And so I think what, what really kept me going each time was, was just sort of looking out at the world and saying, well, well, has somebody else cracked this problem that I thought it was worth spending seven years cracking? Um, no, if, if that's not the case, then, you know, it's probably worth giving it at least one more shot. And eventually, you know, it's like uh, quitters never win and winners never quit. But those who never win and never quit are idiots. I know I'm in one of two categories, basically, is what I'm saying. Either a, a, a winner or an idiot. Or an idiot. One of the two. <laughs> All right. Osama has a question. Uh, you know, you've been doing the same thing. Now you're starting to um, achieve success. You know, initial early success, uh, if you will. Um, I got mine. Was, that's that's that was my first success point. Was was getting one of my own, and I got the I got the first signature series vehicle. So at least that milestone was achieved. And, um, but yeah. So sorry. Continue the question. She's asking about copycats. So, you know, are, do you worry about that? Because it seems like you, someone could just copycat you, right? And you, a lot of the things you're working on, maybe a three-wheel vehicle, simple electric vehicle, blah, blah, blah. And and this is a common thing that I hear entrepreneurs ask about. What, well, can't someone just yeah. steal it or copy me? Or well, And, and what are your definitely, views on it? So, so we have definitely uh, uh, attempted to build a moat of intellectual property around the vehicle we're building. Uh, but that being said, you know, if people want to go out and build fun utility vehicles, hey, come talk to us because our whole business model for international expansion is entirely based around licensing out the design of the factory and the design of the product and the brand and the business model. So we can save you a lot of time, you know, rather than, than tangle in, in any kind of a adversarial role, like let's just partner up together to go take this to the world. Um, and that's that's been our approach. I think we've we've got elements within the vehicle architecture that are uh, some are hard to copy. You know, we've some we've, the drivetrain we've spent a lot of time refining, and you know, it'd be uh, we think it'd be better to just buy it from us or, or partner with us to to make it happen rather than just make a, a crappy knockoff. Right, and I mean that's actually generally the that's a that the best answer you could possibly give because I, I always say like, well, if someone wants to steal your idea. They're basically a co-founder or a partner, right? You right. Know, as you brought up. So early on, it's probably a co-founder. They might have different ideas product. about what share they get, but you know, we, we can we can we can figure that out. So I want to talk. Uh, there, there's so many questions here. I don't even know where to begin. Uh, there was a couple questions coming in, like, "What would you do differently?" You know, oh, given what oh, you know, know now, what I, I would have just. I would have just started with the one we eventually got to. If we'd have just started with number eight first, save would have saved seven years of pain. No, I, I, I think I think honest in honestly though, if I what I would have done differently is I would have gone slower at the beginning. I think I had I had that kind of irrational exuberance coming off of my first exit. Uh, so first company, it's like you go to play baseball for the first time, you step up to the plate. And you just like easily hit it out of the park and you end up under the mistaken assumption that baseball is easy. And I think that was kind of my my sense about what starting companies was like uh, in the spring of 2007. And then, you know, over. So, so I went very quickly, uh, you know, started really torching my 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 dry powder, as it were, uh, in order to, to to make what I thought was yardage. And I think if I if I had taken a slower approach. Um, it, particularly at the beginning, particularly when I knew it, the least amount that I knew over the course of the project, um, that we would have actually made more progress faster in the long run. So started a little bit slower. Um, yeah, slow, slow, slow roll to start, particularly if you're coming off of uh, an exit in in a, a different realm. Well, in general, it might be better to put some 
thought and customer development in before diving into the empty pool, if you will. A um, c- couple questions coming in about regulation um, and, you know, another one about maybe taking the company private or staying private. You know, uh, would, like I said, we would entertain offers at $420 a share to go private. We're, we're, we, funding has not been secured for such a move, but we would entertain offers. It's only a 100x difference between our current share price and our, our, our go private price, but just throwing that out there. I was throwing it out there. But, but, you know, obviously people are like, oh, being public's kind of a pain and, you know, you don't have to, I'm just, it's from, well, uh, it, 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 it does, the there is some reporting, there's some reporting overhead. Um, in, in terms of, but, but I think for us, it's actually, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a helpful thing um, because it, it, it does, we are a NASDAQ listed company. Uh, when we talk to suppliers, when we talk to customers, um, that, that adds a, a, a level of credibility. And I, you know, for people, particularly for our customers who want to be a part of the story, they, they can be a part of it, not just by uh, putting down a, a reservation, but by actually owning stock in the company. And so that that's something that I think is actually very cool. I, I think for for companies that have sort of a public mission, um, it's a good thing that the public can have a chance to actually participate in it, put their money uh, where, where they where they where their heart is. Right. I I, lo- I love that actually. That's the the best argument. You know, I, I was um, uh, having that same discussion with Elon, and you know, the si- similar sentiments exist there. That like you know, there is this public mission, yeah. right? Well, but then you and, have detractors from it, right? Whether it be the short sellers or you have the people who are betting against your mission one way or another, right? I mean, you've had some some trouble with like frivolous lawsuits and things of that nature. Definitely. And, I mean, you know, so I, I don't know, like do you, the, the pro con of the detractors, do you, I don't know how you, you feel you about definitely, it. You definitely become a bigger target, but I think you, you know, especially in the in the vehicle realm, you can't avoid that uh, by when, once you're in the marketplace anyway. Right. right. There are going to be people who are going to be going after you either way. Um, right. But but I, I to, to to where we are at this point, I think that the benefits outweigh the downsides. Um, but like I said, uh, at that price, I would also be willing to consider a <laughs> private offer. So just just throwing that out there. Uh, um, I, so, uh, yeah. Oh, no, it, it, you know, it, it, and I think what we've really, tra- the last thing there is that, and again, kind of to the point of the, the quarterly update videos is that we're, we're trying to leverage, um, our, our, our public reporting to do as much general market communication as we can. Um, so that we're not just communicating way. to the, yeah. the investment world, but we're also communicating to the world. We have a few hundred people still on, and there were was even more when we showed that video. I mean, if you haven't seen it, is there is it on Arkimoto.com? Yes. I mean, this it, is it, really a, a, a like I wish every public company made a video like that because well, we've actually, actually gotten that feedback from from investors from our public market investors saying I I wish all the CEOs of the companies I'm invested in would do that same thing. Um, and it's just what you do, and this is not just for public companies; this is for anybody pitching on any kind of a regular basis. So if you spend, if you're a CEO, I'm, I'm assuming that they're in the, in the crew out here, they're CEOs of startup companies. A lot. Spend a lot of time with a pitch deck in front of investors. And the worst thing about having like a 20 slide pitch deck is that you get interrupted five times. You, the guy's asking about something that's three slides ahead. You get off your game. You didn't drink enough coffee, whatever it is. When you have a video that tells you, tells the full arc of your story and you can tell just about any story in three or four or five minutes, you walk into the pitch meeting, you press play, you sit back, they watch the video, and then you spend the next 25 minutes on Q&A, actually talking about, you know, having a real conversation about what you're doing instead of spending 25 minutes on the slides and five minutes actually getting to one question. So it really changes the nature of your conversations with investors, with customers, with everything. And, well, and it's just you can't do it for every kind of business, though. I mean, you know, if you're doing, I don't know, r- drug discovery, it's like here in the lab, Johnny's looking at cells. <laughs> like, well, uh, you, you, gotta, you, you definitely have to have to 
again, and this comes to learning how to tell the story, learning how to communicate your vision. You're going to be communicating it to some audience that is relevant to your to your future success. Um, and and so learning how to make that communication very crisp, take out words that don't help. Once you get the narrative in there, yes, the B-roll footage that you throw over it is going to be different, right? If you're if you're doing a, a an, you know an internet B two B e-commerce site or something like that, it's, it might not be quite as sexy as you know three wheel electric vehicles ripping down the road, but there's you can usually find something that helps connect the narrative that's a visual component or that paints the picture that you're trying to trying to what's the world that you are uh, that you, that you are catalyzing the shift into right there's a, there's a lot you can do with video that you can't do um, just with a with tech slides of text um, so so my recommendation to entrepreneurs generally and yeah it might not work for everybody but for a lot of companies having a short very concise video and getting getting to the point where you can tell your company story in video is a really useful it's a really useful tool that video was three minutes long right so they, they it, you conveyed a lot of information in just a few minutes yep and, and so, once we figured out kind of that narrative structure that we, we we basically just used essentially the same narrative structure from the first quarter of this year to the second we'll largely use that same narrative structure on the third quarter and it'll all be just about saying, you know, well, what happened in the last three months? Um, so, so I want to, you know, this, I'm what, reading the questions. They're like pounding in and, and we're, we're picking questions to cover. Um, the, a ton of questions came in about bootstrapping, but I want to talk about another ton of questions came in about the IPO, right? Or, or the process that the... I, I'll let you explain it. I know what you did, yeah. but uh, so, you did a kind so, of unusual path to an IPO, but yeah. um, interesting as well. And there's so many things out there, so many alternative ideas out there, the, the initial corn offering. So, but let's talk about your path to an IPO. So, reinventing <laughs> the ICO. We did that at our company party. Uh, so so the, we did a Regulation A, uh, a Tier 2 Regulation A offering. And so for folks who don't know, uh, in w when Congress passed the Jobs Act in 2012, I think it included a rework of Regulation A, uh, which has been in the securities law mm -hmm. since the 1930s, but was was really not regularly used for registered offerings of stock because it had a pretty high burden of, of documentation. It was state by state registration and uh, had a five million dollar cap on it. What, what the Jobs Act did is it created a new kind of offering with a maximum amount of a $50 million raise, um, and, and it took out the state-by-state -state registration as long as you did this Tier 2 piece of it. Um, and, and, and what that meant is that you know, it, it put, a very, uh, put a firm timeline on the SEC for responses to submissions and documentation. So where a normal S1 can drag on for you know, many, many, many months, uh, there's like a basically a 90 day fixed window from you know submission to getting through the process. Mm -hmm. um, there's no quiet period, so you can advertise online. You can you can advertise to your affinity base, like your existing pre order customers and people who are interested. In your product. It's, it's like a, it's it's almost crowd is con considered our crowdfunding reg yeah. regulations in the yeah. U.S. Even though it's not really crowdfunding, it, it blends the idea of crowdfunding with a, a, a more traditional, you know. And again, this is an SEC qualified, audited financials, full offering documents uh, offer. So it was still, you know, it was still a considerable undertaking to put the offering together. It but could cost the, you what, like half a million dollars to all, do? All, all in, it was it was about a quarter of a million. Okay, all in yeah, a quarter so, of a million. That's to so, step one, right? That's to when you could make the offering. Right. Yeah, I mean, no, that's that's yeah, that got us through uh, the offering. I mean, that didn't include our underwriters' fees, but uh, that was that was the legal, that was the accounting, that was the uh, all of the offering preparation. Yeah, so and, and that's you know, it's anywhere between a fifth to a tenth of what a, a typical IPO could cost, right? So it's oh, a yeah. it's a substantial reduction again for these for a smaller scale offering, and the, the idea was. The reason why Regulation A was was changed was because over the last 15 years, it's gotten harder and harder and harder for companies to do IPOs. Um, 
such that almost impossible. You, know, you end up with these uh, these kind of stranded unicorns. Um, I mean, my my sense is that if if that tool had been available for companies like Lyft or Uber or Airbnb at the times when that would have been in their sweet spot, that it would have been a no brainer because they could have gone to all their drivers, all their uh, all their people who had rental properties and said, hey, why don't you be a part? Why don't you be an actual investor in this as well as one of our uh, you know kind of key right. Uh, uh, part so of that goes back to what you were saying earlier about having your early buyers of the product yeah. also be investors in the company, right? And, and so, so the the way that our deal was put together, we we the, our underwriter was W R Hambrecht. The Bill Hambrecht uh, is an was an early investor in Arcimoto and was a big advocate of the Jobs Act. He's the guy. I mean, back in the day, he did the IPOs for companies like Apple and Intel and Amazon, and uh, he did Google's Dutch auction. So uh, he's been, uh, and, and he was growing more and more um, concerned that that early stage kind of high growth opportunities were not did not have access to the public markets. And then you um, uplifted, and, right? Because you went into this reggae plus situation, and then you actually uplifted into the public markets, right? Well, well re reggae you can just list on Nasdaq. So because because it is a, a fully qualified offering. Um, you can list on NASDAQ or on New York Stock Exchange at the conclusion of the offering. So, the, the, but the way the deal was put together, they, they basically managed a broker dealer selling group. Um, and, and, and by the way, that, that whole aspect, I mean, when you, whether you're working with uh, investment bankers or with uh, broker dealers who are out there selling your security, I mean, the, the, what, what, what hit me was that, you know, for years, when when we sold stock, it was because I was selling the stock. I was like, hey, here's my pitch. You know, please consider this opportunity. And that was the first time we had basically like 80 people out there who were all, you know, doing that, doing that same work. And that was um, if, if, if you can imagine having 80 people or even 20 people uh, helping to tell your story, uh, it, it really takes a huge load off. But then, we, because it was a, it was something we could we could advertise on our website, we actually did about uh, twenty percent of the deal, I think more than twenty percent of the deal, on our own site. So people coming and buying stock directly from us. Is that by volume or number? By cat by dollars. Wow. So so w w related to that for a sec, you know, because there are a lot of new entrepreneurs here. I mean, there, I'm sure there's no way you thought you were going to run a public company when you started this thing, and like now you are. No, it just um, basically be like, what's your exit strategy? It's like well, IPO, of course. I mean, it's the standard answer, right? No, did I, you, I, 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 you, I, I, you, did you ever say that? I don't remember. Yeah, well, I mean, and I would jokingly like, oh yeah, we're going to IPO, you know? Like, it's like, oh, but how I, you did? Wow, holy cow! Now I'm gonna see. Well, so like, and I would say you really learned it as you went, though, right? I yeah. mean, this is. Yeah, I mean, this is like so. A lot yeah. of entrepreneurs they have fear of doing things. I mean, sure, it wasn't easy, right? But you, I think again, we were we were fortunate that we had a really good team. So our 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 accounting team, the auditors were great. Uh, we worked with CrowdCheck on the offering document preparation, and they've really focused on uh, reggae is one of their specialties. They were awesome. Um, our our own internal team. I mean, I just we, we've got a uh, a stellar group of folks who are out there actually. I mean, just selling the deal on the road and and telling people the story and and giving test drives around Manhattan and all the rest. Uh, I think where where we you know the, the real opportunities um, that we could what I would advise. And again, we were like the fifth company uh, ever to do a reggae and then list on a major exchange. And the ones who did it before us were like in the in the three months prior. So it was we were very early through this new process. Um, and I think I think you know one of the learning lessons that has come over the course of the last year is that the it's you know you, you really it's like if, if for for golfers you know you don't stop the golf swing once it contacts the ball. You got to kind of swing right. through right and and learning how to uh, to manage investor relations as a publicly traded company. That's that's the one component of the team that we didn't have during the deal that we didn't really even bring on until, you know, months after we were listed um, that I would advise uh, that, that everyone doing contemplating going public 
has has or, a or really any good, sort of IC, yeah. any sort of uh, IPO got a great IR team on board. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, IR team on board. Right, that's crowdfunding. Any, 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 because you've got now thousands of people that are stakeholders in your success that need to be managed. I want to do two last things, Scott. In okay. effort of time. man, I am in. Uh, you made my day. Hopefully, you made everyone like else's life. day. Um, I, I mean, there's so many things we could cover. Maybe we even have a chance to do this again. I want to do two things though. Last okay. one, I just want to pimp the vehicle for a second. This is like one of the, the, the amazing rides that you can, and I'm not kidding. I am literally going, and you can attest, uh, tweet it out. Uh, there it is, right. order number whatever, but uh, 5,000. So I'm gonna do it uh, today, and I hope everyone has a chance. So if they wanted to do the pre-order like I'm about to do, it's at arcomoto.com? Yep. All right. Yeah. Any. Any things you want to throw out about the vehicle? People are asking, what's its top speed? Is it road yeah, ready? So, blah, so blah, basic, blah. basic specs, uh, it's, it's uh, um, top speed 80 miles an hour, uh, zero to 60 in seven and a half seconds. Um, we're, we are shooting for, we have two different battery models that we're planning. One that's a shorter range that we're shooting for 70 miles. One that will we think will go up to 130 miles. Um, and, and again, our, our focus is people talk about range anxiety or whatever. Our focus is really on all the daily driving trips that you take. Uh, once we're in the full swing of production, we're shooting for a base model price of eleven thousand nine hundred. And then that's for the lower lots, battery pack one, right? Yeah, for the lower battery pack. Uh, and then there are lots of ways that you can you can enhance the vehicle. Uh, adding Doors, various yeah. door options, uh, surfboard rack, uh, golf club rack storage bins, air conditioning, whatever. But we, we want to make sure that that very base model is still a, a truly competent, everyday solution for a lot of mobility problems. That's beautiful. And then the second thing, so a ton of entrepreneurs watched. Um, we covered a lot of ground here. Is there anything that, you know, advice you would say to a new entrepreneur that's thinking of starting an impactful business but may because a lot of the questions were sort of hesitations on how to get my team members. I don't know how to get people to believe. Any sort of advice, general advice you would give in closing? Uh, you know, some of the things that helped me on on the in, in terms of learning how to do uh, the narrative structure. There are some really good talks on uh, TEDx talks and YouTube talks, like uh, the secret the secret structure of great talks. It was one of those talks. Um, where where the where the where the author goes through and kind of breaks down um, I have a dream uh, breaks down the the Apple introduction of the iPhone breaks down uh, Kennedy's uh, speech and 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 finds these these common narrative structures that are that are useful for persuading people um, not just uh, you know and, and it's really all about how do we get from where we are today to this this kind of uh, the, the promised land of some 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 attainable future that we think that we agree is a good thing and 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 building that how do you build that narrative and how do you persuade people to 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 join you in making that dream real i think that's been uh, particularly for ceos of impact companies it's it's absolutely critical so um and and if you're if you're afraid of public speaking uh then then do it i mean just just go to Toastmasters, work on it. Um, I've, I've, I feel like the, you know, where I spent 20 years of my life focusing mostly on physics and math and coding and, and all that, uh, what I really had to learn through Arkimoto is, is how to write effectively, uh, how to speak effectively, and mostly how to listen effectively, um, which is because a lot of people will bring you um, problems in the form of a solution, as in, you should do X, and you're like, well, X doesn't actually, X conflicts with a whole bunch of the other things. So you kind of disregard it. But what, if you, if you dig into the solution that they're providing, usually underneath that is some problem that they see that you are not addressing. Uh, and that's been, that's been kind of a consistent factor in the development of, of the Arkimoto is, is listening for the problems. Because, you know, like the very first vehicles we, we designed had one seat because most of the trips that people take are alone. 
Um, and when, when it took a long time of people telling me over and over and over again, I will never buy a one seat vehicle for me to finally get it through my head that people are not going to buy that, even though, you know, my, my market research about driving patterns suggests one particular thing. So the, the, the trick was how do we add an extra seat? Uh, how do we solve the problem that those people were pointing at, but do it in a way that, that was still very consistent with the vision for the product that we were trying to build. That's beautiful, Mark. Thank you so much for your time. Well done. Big Thanks, applause. Buddy. Hey, <laughs> slow clap. Uh, really good to see you, man. And uh, yeah, let's do this again. We didn't even we didn't even talk about voting this time, so you know. Let's uh, recover. Well, the other, the, the, just so you know, uh, Mark has essentially the equivalent of hobbies to work on <laughs> democracy and other things. So you know, once you get in the world field of trying to make the world better you don't just stop with vehicles you you move to anything and everything you see so with that said thank you so much for your time thank you everyone for tuning in we've had as many as 400 currently around 250 this is amazing probably even more six seven hundred that have come through thank you everyone thank you mark thanks dale great to see you man cheers